On the third day of the crusade, that was, that was the day I was ministering. I was not so conversant with the terrain, with the territory. But the people that were doing, playing the role of ushers were conversant with the territory and they knew her. So the moment she stumbled on the ground, the ushers got the signals and they faded. I was high there on the altar, garnished with my white suit. I was so visible. On the third day of the crusade, that was, that was the day I was ministering, a mad woman, a mad lady, came for the crusade. And when the usher, because she sees the violent mad, you know, there are some people that are just mad and uh, they are not violent. It's a psychological issue. They are talking about rainfall in the midst of drought and how the rain came and, uh, that, yeah, and they are, <laughs> hallelujah. This one is a violent mad. And you know, I was not so conversant with the terrain, with the territory. But the people that were doing, playing the role of ushers were conversant with the territory and they knew her as a violent mad. So the moment she stumbled on the ground, the ushers got the signals and they faded. It happened to be that the cameraman we paid to cover the meeting did not come for the first day of the crusade, not come for the second day. It's on the day I was preaching that the cameraman showed. I was high there on the altar, garnished with my white suit. I was so visible. And the woman saw me glow on the pulpit and she made her way to the altar without any resistance because the ushers had moved out. In my mind, I felt that a man of God should not run. So I confronted her, and she gave me a slap. That was when I knew that those, those stars that they write, they draw in cartoon, when they slap somebody, then stars, they are, they are realities. Because what came out were stars. And by the time I recovered from the impact of the slap, I noticed that the cameraman took interest, keen interest of the happenings. And I was too close to her to run at this time. So I now look to God. And I prayed in tongues, prayed in the spirit, prayed in the spirit, prayed in the spirit. And the Lord says, shout. So I now shouted. That my shout took her from the ground and threw her to one angle. And our crusade continued. Do you realize that at the end of the crusade, we took inventory, that lady that got, meanwhile, she was delivered from the madness. That lady that got delivered, no, wait, that lady that got delivered from the madness is the daughter of that man that gave that country. Guess what? After the crusade, the man was no longer angry with our prayers. <laughs> Hear, O shepherd of Israel. So he commanded ravens, and these ravens, because of the commandment, they were prayed contrary to their natural nature in keeping with the commandment. But you see, I told you that the commanded blessing is in two, pro, two fold. The first aspect of the commanded blessings is what we call a feeding program. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Are you there? Okay. So whenever we talk about feeding, then we should be talking about ration. How many rations did God make available to Elijah? Verse 5. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the book chariot that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and fish in the morning. Bread and fish. What? 
in the evening. Now, this was the scripture that made me come up with an argument that official eating. Okay, let me not go there. There will be a problem. There will be a problem here. As there was a problem when I raised it, there will also be a problem here today. So let us avoid that problem. It's, it's, a, it's a serious case. When God was the one in charge of the rations, <laughs> there will be problems. I have, I'm already seeing it. So let's just leave. Let's just leave that matter. So in the feeding program, there are rations. And in this particular case, there were two rations. Ration in the morning and ration what? Okay, stay with me. Let's go on. Second scripture, 1 Kings chapter 17, beginning from verse 8. Let's do 7 first so that you will get the context. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. See, God doesn't want you to make a God out of the direction he gave you. So, even the directives of God, the directives of God, the wisdom of God, the directions he gives has expiring dates. So, it came to pass that the brook dried up. As the brook was drying up, the prophet began to press more to find out what the next strategy would be. You can be operating a wisdom plan which is based on the directives of God and then that plan begins to expire. The flexibility to launch into seeking God again for the next strategy That flexibility is what is lacking in many of us, especially in ministry. You are doing something and the thing is prospering. You are doing something and it is producing results. You are doing something and it is moving. It will not move forever. If what you are building is the kingdom of God, a time will come where God will give another directive that is superior to this previous one. And for many preachers, because the old directive produced finances, results, uh, they are no longer willing to continue following God. So, they stop becoming ministers, they become administrators, they stop becoming ministers, ministration, they now start doing administration. I've seen many people, especially in these days of social media, if you stay on social media for long and you're getting likes and getting views, you can make money. I've seen people on social media that have left their calling to remain on social media. Doing what they were not called to do. Because at the end of the day, you put a a bank account there and if there are 2,800 people that came, maybe 300 people might put something in the bank account. And it is daily. Say, hey, money did this thing no. And they don't ask themselves, how long will I continue in this? Until I'm 95? The revelations of God are progressive. And the reason why it is like that, the directives of God are progressive. The reason why it's like that, because God wants to separate the people that are following him from the people that want to follow things. Unfortunately, our generation has chosen things as a better God than our God. So a lot of people's obedience has stopped at a place where there is a boom in the supply chain. Meanwhile, the prophet was willing. The Bible did not say that the ravens stopped coming. It's one of the variables that began to dry up. And the prophet knew that this was a sign that this directive is expiring. I've seen people that have expired in ministry because they held on to a directive that was no longer relevant. But it was true that it was God that spoke. But they were not flexible enough to latch on to the next 
consignments of direction from God and they got stuck and God left them behind. Many ministers in the Nigerian context have entered into prosperity. It's just like Isaac that entered Rehoboth. But Rehoboth was not the last destination in that move from Sitna to Isek to Rehoboth and then to Beersheba. Rehoboth is a place of prosperity, a place of enlargement. Because he said that the Lord had made room for us and we shall increase in the land. It was prosperity. So God led him all the way and led him into prosperity and led him out of prosperity into covenant. But many of us are likely to stop the movement in prosperity. That's where we'll know whether you serve God or you serve mammon. 